But what I do want to talk about is regenerative and biologic medicine. And what we do for a lot of our folks that have chronic pain, mostly musculoskeletal, we're kind of limited to that tonight, not so much the nervous system and whatnot. How do we deal with that? And how do we treat pain, not necessarily with pharmaceuticals, but with regenerative therapies, including electroceuticals, we'll talk in a moment, because we all know how important electricity is. Right. Uh, I have no commercial disclosures. These slides are all either mine or taken from uh, the internet and they have uh, uh, identification uh, for their use. Um, in Arkansas, we've talked about this a little bit. We passed an Emergent Therapies Act where the state of Arkansas, state employees and teachers are self-insured. And so that when they have knee problem uh, in Arkansas, instead of going to get a total knee, which cost about $67,000 in our state, a third of those folks never go back to work. And so instead of getting a total knee because your knee hurts, you can get cell therapies, and it usually requires about three sessions, but, and it's, the cost is somewhere around fifteen to $20,000. But for a third of what it costs for a surgical knee replacement, you can have insurance pay for the cell therapy in Arkansas, and our complication rate is almost negligible. So we're going to save the state millions of dollars the first year, and uh, we have a lot of folks in Arkansas, as you know, that self-insure, including Walmart, Tyson, and most of us. So interesting enough, Arkansas is the first state in the U.S. to start paying for these cell therapies. Um, and a lot of stuff happens basically in small rural states. You know, the east and west coast is just too dense. It's hard to get those folks to understand what we're talking about. The warning on cigarette package came from Ole Miss, University of Mississippi, and the medical student section. Isn't that interesting? So anyway, we got a little interesting things going on in Arkansas these days. And in this picture, you can see our governor in the middle. On the far left-hand side is Scott Baltz, our Democratic congressman. And then Joe Farrar is to his left, the tall guy. And he's our Republican. And then the governor's in the center. Uh, Morgan Pyle really was key to getting all this legislation passed. And then you're clearly on the far right in this picture. Now, what we try to do is to not chase down symptoms so much, and even syndromes, is we try to fix the whole person. Yeah, they'll come in with a sore knee. That's the most common reason folks go to the doc. And we'll fix the knee. But, you know, when you come into our office, we're going to fix you. We're going to give you a chance to fix the knee, but we're going to take care. And it's not just a biological fix. There is a spiritual component to this. And the social aspects of the psychological aspects, all those sort of things are very important. And not only for that, just for that particular patient, but we like to have their families come in so that we can talk to their family. And then it's, at some point down the road, we're going to try to build community centers around the country where you have patient, family, and community center medicine, where these folks can go and get things taken care of that don't require hospitalization. Urgent care is important, and we're really good at that in the United States. But what we're not good at is chronic problems, including aging. Aging is not a disease, but it certainly creates trouble. And you don't need to go to the emergency room for a problem that related to aging of a knee. And so that's our goal, is to try to figure out a way to get this stuff paid for. It doesn't cost nearly as much. It's a standard surgical and pharmaceutical uh, uh, options. It's much safer. And effective, and we try to do more than just fix the patient symptoms. Um, <clears throat> we have six step guidelines, and the, and the federal government likes this. They go, okay, now, Harshville, what are you guys doing? And we go, look, we have six things that we ask people to do. If doctors want to do this. Uh, the first thing is, a, uh, is you have a, a patient consent form. That's extremely important. That's the very beginning. And at the very end of the treatment is a registry. So we follow our results and show that what we do works. But we ask doctors that are gonna do this sort of therapy to do these things. And the first thing is call a family practice doctor. I'm an interventional radiologist. And most of us that do cell therapy injections in this regenerative medicine are not family practitioners, we're specialists. You know, orthopedic surgeons do this. And so we need, when the patient comes in with a sore knee, to call the family practice doctor. 
and say, hey, this is Harshfield, and it'll be a colleague of mine from Conway, Gil Johnson. He'll say, hey, and I'll say, Miss, Miss Smith's in here with us already. Go, oh, thank you, Dave, for taking care of her. He's got 80 to 100 patients a day. He does not have time for this lady. And she's got a lot of other issues. She's overweight. She's got a, more than just knee problems. And so I'm going, Dr. Johnson, I just am asking your permission to treat the patient A and to get access to her electronic medical records. So we don't have to repeat a bunch of tests that have already been done. And, and we'll know stuff and the patients forgot stuff. She had a thyroidectomy when she was 20, stuff like that. So number one, call the primary care doc. Great. Number two, the patient's been a chiropractor or a physical therapist. And so we want to talk with them and say, okay, what do you think is going on with Ms. Smith? And they'll tell us, and it'll be more than just when the knee hurts. They'll say, oh, she sprained her other ankle six months ago, and she's been walking funny. Or she had surgery on that knee five years ago. Th that's important. So number one, call the primary care doc, call the chiropractor, physical therapist. Number three, this is what this group does, the lab work. Let's make sure that we're not just focused on the musculoskeletal system. Because if, if you think of it as a stream, and I've got ultrasound or a C arm, and I'm going to inject this knee, I'm going to be so precise, I'm injecting into a sewer. I want to go to the mouth of the stream. This patient has endocrine problems. That's the mouth of the stream. And let's make sure that the thyroid and, and the pituitary and all those sorts of things, growth hormone that Dr. Runnels talked about yesterday, let's make sure all that's fixed. And then also the immune system, that's next. Because no one's going to heal. A stem cell doesn't fix you. It helps you fix you. So you've got to be healthy as possible. So that's all prehab, which is what the Health Revival Partners Group is about. Then the fourth thing, we put all this stuff together, all the x-rays, everything we can possibly think about and come up with a diagnosis. And number five, we sit down with Ms. Smith and go, okay, here's what we think is going on with you. We think you have arthritis of the knee and you're a little overweight. Your thyroid needs to be tweaked a bit. you got some uh, elevated set rate, so you got some inflammation. None of this is surprising, but we got to fix all that if your knee is going to actually get better. And then we sit back and ask the patient, what do you want to do? And they always look at it. It's like, what? You're supposed to tell me what to do. And I go, no, no, no. You, you get 51% of the vote here. You can do all the things you've been doing. In fact, Ms. Smith, you've actually been getting better and you're losing a little weight. You don't need a stem cell injection right now. I think you're doing fine as, just as you are. An option is to do nothing other than what you're doing. And often the patient will select that. Sometimes I go, well, I've been doing this for six or eight months and I'm just not quite over the hill. I want a platelet-rich plasma injection or I want a stem cell injection. And we'll go, okay, well, that's, that's an option also. Um, <clears throat> so what we try to do is to treat these folks not as a one-off, but to do the same thing over and over and over and over. Now, we're going to talk about the 12, the 12 systems of the human body the problem is we get too focused on those, right? Or we get disease focused. And we wanna not do that, we wanna get patient focused. And of those 12 systems, you've got 82 organs. And when you're pregnant, the placenta is a 83rd organ. How about that? So we, what we wanna do is back up a little bit and realize that when we, and what I do, I do a lot of cardiovascular stuff and musculoskeletal stuff and neural stuff, but when I'm treating one or two or three of those systems, the other nine are listening. And so when I assess them with the lab work, like we do with the Health Revival Partners lab work and so forth. So our goals, these integrative cellular medicine centers are just that. We integrate all the silos of the doctors, the primary care guys, everybody the patient's seen. We want to talk to them. They know stuff about the patient. We want to transform the education for these docs in, in, in the research and how we practice and have a shift in organ-based system. Oh, I've got a liver problem. Well, yeah, okay, your liver functions aren't normal, but you've got a, a human being problem. It's more than just the gastrointestinal system. And let's don't get so organ-based 
and let's get a more personalized approach. And, and that sounds like a Hallmark, Hallmark card, you know, ingratiating comment, but it means don't focus on the disease, focus on the patient, but even more important, get their family in the room with you and talk to them and find out where they live. Because what we're going to try to do is to take this out to communities so they can start doing chronic uh, health care problems, including aging, without having to use a hospital or an emergency room. Now, we've talked about this at, at length. Energy is the essence of life. It's also the essence of healing. And there are different types of energy in the body. The bioelectric fields are the most fascinating uh, uh, to me. Uh, and I'm not talking about the electricity that travels down nerves, that tells the muscles what to do. That's important. That's, but that's biochemical. That's bioelectric. There is a bioelectric, a non-neural, does not come from the nerves, bioelectric field. It's really interesting. And I'm going to give you guys some links to, to watch and listen to. And it comes from a vibration that's deep down inside of each cell from the, the microtubules and so forth. It, and it's really an interesting phenomenon. A lot of the bioelectric field can be changed mentally with meditation and things like that. So a lot of this we've talked about before. It's non-physical. How do we fix my knee? We have things we can do. We can amputate it, put some plastic parts in. Great. Total knee. You can do that. A lot of stuff short of that, though. And I think we ought to uh, look at that first. Tesla said the day that Science begins to study non-physical phenomena. It'll make more progress in one decade than in all the previous uh, centuries of its existence. It's hard to get physicians to think about stuff they can't touch, which is strange because if you think how you look at a sick muscle or a sick brain, you might do an electromyogram to look at a muscle, an electroencephalogram. It's electricity of the brain. You can't see it or touch it. Uh, how do you do electrocardiogram of the heart? So doctors understand the electricity, but then that, that's it. They don't want to think about how to fix something they can't touch with a scalpel or with a pill. So the bioelectric medicine uh, is the final common pathway between health and disease. And if you look at all the physical things we talk about, all the way down to the end of the endothelial lining, when you finally get to the molecules, then you get into the quantum realm, that's the non-physical part. And that's the thing we have to consider. And so that when we're fixing a thyroid hormone, we are really fixing the interstitial space that bathes all the cells in our body. And you, there's no way that you are able to fix every molecule and mineral in the body. In general, you keep the patient well hydrated, get them in the sunlight, make sure the hormones are balanced, you do these general things and it does some very specific uh, therapies, much of which ends up being non-physical so that we don't really have to understand it. I think it's fun to think about, but you don't have to understand quantum physics to fix mammoth's knee. And as Einstein said, everything is energy. So, Energy can either be created or destroyed. We've talked in philosophically, I've got an idea sort of how things happen. I agree with Tesla. I don't think our bodies or brains are generators of energy and that when we die, that all that dies with us. I think more in terms of us, we are, our brains are a receiver, like a radio or a television set. And we're receiving transmissions from a, the third level. There are three levels of energy that have been postulated. And this third level, the life for, essential life force of the universe, is vibrating in our microtubules in each and every one of us. It makes us unique. And that we are receiving that. And our brain is only receiver in the universe. There's a core from which we obtain knowledge, strength, and inspiration. Tesla said he has never penetrated into the secrets of the core, but he knows that it exists. And I believe he's right. We're not in the universe, we are the universe, the intrinsic part of it. Ultimately, you're not a person, but a focal point where the universe is becoming conscious of itself. We're little miracles, each and every one of us. If you look at these three energy levels, we know the physical level, 
The two levels we are aware of, we can see and measure the periodic table, physical elements, molybdenum, and so forth. The, the second one's electromagnetic spectrum. We can't see all the electromagnetic spectrum, but visible light we can see. So we go, okay, we get that. So those are two levels of energy we understand. The third is the vital energy source that we can't measure, but it's, we are start, we are becoming aware of. And, and here's the thing. We know about 5% of the universe. 95% of the universe is dark matter and dark energy. Holy smokes. So let's try to keep our minds open. Let's get back to Ms. Smith and take care of her knee and realize it's a spiritual venture. And it's more than just a knee. It's a social thing and biologic and so forth. Uh, and that this is going to make this a lot more of a, uh, not a sick care system, but a health care system. And the universe doesn't speak English. It speaks uh, English, doesn't it, Andrew? And when we changed over, when the A string was changed over by the Germans in the Second World War to 440 hertz, it messes up. Look at the energy. So look how water looks. It's amorphous. But when the A note on a guitar string is 432 hertz. That's perfect. That's in sync with the universe. So frequency is very important. And here's eight hertz, eight cycles per second can be this small, can make that much difference. And look at how uh, uh, water molecules change their morphology just by speaking <laughs> words of love and gratitude. Here's a John Lennon, uh, the Imagine song playing and look how the water it's beautiful and crystalline, and look at a heavy metal music song. I played a little bit of that myself, so I've, I've damaged my water. But now I'm back in tune. Here's the here's the deal. Once you know something, you own it. And I always warn people when I give these talks, you didn't know some of this stuff before today, but after today, you know it. And if you do something, it's like when I tell my physician friends, these total knees don't work like you think they do. And this regenerative medicine works this way. It's very safe, very inexpensive. And after, starting Monday morning, you keep putting total knees in instead of this, it's on you. Before this day, you were ignorant of this. But on Monday morning, you're not. And it's your decision. Once you know something, you own it. And that's what this is about. Research is to see what everybody else has seen to think what no one else has thought looking at the very same thing. And I think what happens, it's your mind. This, this little cartoon, he's reading in the book, the, no, the knowledge is in, and now look at what he's looking at now that he was not, not able to see before. And it's going to be lonely to do this. Now, bioenergetics and electrophys electrophysiology makes sense to us. Oh, man, I know physiology and biophysics. I got to... I got a master's in it. Um, I had no clue of any of this stuff uh, back in medical school. What we learned, the biochemistry and biochemical electricity is certainly a thing, but the bioelectric uh, field is a totally different concept. Um, we sort of look at um, non-neural bioelectric fields and trying to decide what's consciousness and subconscious and so forth. And we talked about this. The brain, unfortunately, we think we're pretty smart, and our cortex is really smart, but basically it's a slave to our limbic system. The brain stem and spinal cord tell us when we're hungry, when it's time to go to sleep, and so forth. Those really are the, uh, the impulses that drive what we do, and our cortex just tries to fix what the limbic system tells us we need to. And the mind over matter will have that talk sometime down the line. Uh, speaking of timing, when you get injured during the daytime, you heal better. Who knew? So, so, <laughs> so if you're going to have surgery, <clears throat> have it in the daytime. Don't have it at night. Um, and we, a man and I were talking about this. I'm not sure about emotional injury. I mean, that's kind of interesting. I, I, I'm talking about if you break a bone, it'd be better to break it at noon. it will heal faster. But I don't know about getting your heart broken. You know, and we, but we do know that the brain tends to cleanse better at night, doesn't it? When we are asleep, our extracellular fluid goes up by 60% and flushes all the brain out. That's why it's so, so important to get good sleep. So the, 
wounds, musculoskeletal, let's say that, we'll leave the other open for discussion. Yeah, if we're gonna treat electrical problems, we don't want a pharmaceutical, um, and we need an electroceutical. And what we found is about 80% of infections, the bacteria build a biofilm, it's a slimy film that forms on these wounds. And the bacteria generate their own electricity and they use electric fields to communicate how they talk and cover themselves and hide. It makes it more hostile and difficult to treat. But we figured out now how to use an electrical field-based dressing to treat these biofilms rather than antibiotics. The dressing electrochemically generates a volt of energy. And you think, well, oh, by the way, it won't, won't shock you. But one volt is a thousand millivolts. Remember, inside a cell is minus 25 millivolts. So that's a lot of energy. And what are we talking about? How do you heal things? You want to get electrons in the cell. So these dressings now, we're going to start using. And they're talking about making some of the textiles in hospital, hospital beds and pillows and stuff with these electrical fabrics. So it really interesting, electroceuticals. And now let's talk about regenerative medicine. Uh, this is going to talk about injecting sugar water to make pain go away. And that's going to be hard to believe. And how we take cells out of the body, platelets are a very common one, platelet rich plasma we use. And we can take stem cells out of the fat and, and out of the bone marrow. And now these are not, no embryonic stem cells. Now we don't do that. Uh, these are mesenchymal adult stem cells that are in each and every one of us. And we can use those and concentrate them to help us heal things faster. Now, regenerative medicine is part tissue engineering and part nutritional therapy. That's why what Dr. Lewis and this group is about is so important. And we talk about injecting stem cells in to heal a wound or a problem. Stem cells do not do anything directly. We talked about this. It's an indirect effect. Stem cells are like the, the refreshment card on the golf course. We put them into an area that's injured and you've got a lot of patient stem cells, golfers staggering around out here making double bogeys and they, they can't do anything. They can't fix the tissue or the tear or the fracture. We inject stem cells, the refreshment cart comes in, out comes a Gatorade and hot dogs. The patient stem cells have got to go over to the cart and get stimmy, get refreshed. And that's why it's so important that they are ready to do that. The endocrine system, immune system, extracellular fluids got to be clean. I mean, that all that needs to be in, intact before you inject stem cells. So it's not a standalone uh, therapy. Now, regenerative therapy, we're going to talk about, we, we use dextrose. And dextrose, remember sugar, six carbon unit, C6, O6, H12. It's got six carbons, looks like a little hexagon. It's got six oxygen molecules and 12 hydrogens. And when you eat the sugar molecule, the first thing it does when it goes inside the cell, it gets cut in half and forms two, three carbon pyruvate molecules. Now, if you've got oxygen, it will go into the Krebs cycle and make 38 ATP, little batteries, adenosine triphosphate. But if you're anaerobic, let's say you're out jogging and you're using anaerobic metabolism, you can only make two ATP per glucose molecule instead of 38. So that's why we need to be oxygenated as much as possible. That's why exercise is so important. So what do these carbon molecules do? When they cleave, they release electrons. We just talked about that. And that's voltage. And that's how we heal. And one of the things that glucose is known to do is decrease pain. Chronic pain, now that's different than acute pain, that not a fractured femur or a heart attack. That's a different kind of pain. Pain that's been there for several weeks to months is generally... Uh, caused by low energy level in an area. And these nerves that are yelling are right below the surface of the skin. Most of these folks with uh, low back and hip pain, if you'll take a half inch Botox needle with some buffer glucose and inject right below the skin over the pain area, their pain's gone. 
It's not coming from the hip or the deeper structures. And what these nerves are doing is telling the, the central nervous system, hey, I don't have enough energy to fix this stuff. We put those little glucose injections, little drops of glucose in. Pain is gone instantly. It's really cool. Sugar changes the pain uh, uh, the impulse instantly. Lidocaine, doctor's office, you know, dentist's office numbing medicine takes 20 minutes. And the glucose works on the potassium, potassium channel and lidocaine works on the sodium channel. And those are both positive charged ions, but the electricity is affected instantly by these sugar injections. It's the coolest thing you've ever seen. Uh, now the biologics that we can use, we can use platelet-rich plasma. We take the blood, draw it, spin it down. Uh, we don't need the red blood cells. And uh, we can use the plate, the poor plasma, it looks like olive oil on top of the tube. We want that buffy coat layer between the two. The platelets live right there, as do the stem cells that live in the bloodstream. CD34 cells, the CD cells with 34, with this 34 marker on it, are stem cells. And 4% of your bloodstream have these CD34 cells, and 4% of your bone marrow cells or stem cells, I'd much rather draw blood and aspirate my marrow. It's a lot less painful and it works as well. So we use uh, plate rich plasma. We use bone marrow aspirate and occasionally we'll use some fat graft material. And we've now started using some amnion fluid because amniotic tissue and fluid is uh, not, not embryonic. Now, don't, don't confuse that, please. Uh, at, at birth, when a patient donates their placenta, they can take this little amnion layer off of there and collect the fluid, and that is immunoprivileged. You can give it to any human. And we learned this back in the 50s from the equine industry, the horse industry. Uh, they taught us this. Apparently, a generation of veteran, veterinarians have forgotten it. That's interesting. So some of our older folks have old uh, platelets and old stem cells. And we use this amnion fluid to rejuvenate their knees. And we also use that to do inhalation therapy for treating brain and, and cardiopulmonary structures. So there's, there are uh, basically regenerative injection with using glucose. And then we also have biologics of which play the rich plasma, uh, bone marrow derived stem cells from the patient and these new amnion fluids. Hilton in 1863, I mean, this is a couple, you know, 100 and a half years ago, it, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're doing now has been in the literature for years, and it was just sort of forgotten. But basically what John Hilton said is that the nerve supplying the joint, joint also supplies the muscles that move that joint, the skin that covers it, the capsule that keeps it intact. So when we're looking at, I've got a meniscus tear, or I've got bone on bone, or I've got a capsule tear or ligament, guess what? Fix the nerve, it will restore those st structures. So we're doing neural res restoration with our regenerative therapies, more so than we're trying to actually grow a meniscus or piece of cartilage. Uh, again, here's the question, guys, <laughs> where does life begin? That'll be another talk for another day. Now, we talked about the extracellular matrix. That's the fluid within which all the cells in the body float in tissues. And that's the, that's the fluid that we can change by our diet, our exercise, sunlight, and so forth. Um, of the entire fluid content of the human body, two-thirds are in two-thirds of the water is inside the cells, one-third is outside the cells. And then you got blood and a little cerebrospinal fluid. So mostly the extracellular fluid is about a third, one third to two thirds. And we can't do anything directly inside the cell, but we can make our extracellular fluid healthy. And then the membrane of the cell takes off and does what it needs to do. And remember extracellular fluid increases when you're asleep. So, and hopefully I hadn't put anybody asleep yet, but maybe, maybe later. Now, here's interesting. The fascia is a scaffolding, and it was thought to be the largest organ. And by the way, we, we learn wrong stuff all the time. It's my favorite thing to do, is to try to unlearn things. The fascia is a scaffolding within the interstitial space. 
Now, between the skin and the muscle is this fat tissue. And there's more nervous tissue there than any tissue in the body. And that's where I call this our spacesuit. You can tell vibration, heat, chemical burn, pain, and so forth. That's, that's the part of your body that tells you what's going on in your environment. The fascia is the scaffolding within which the fat tissue and nerve and all that stuff live. So the fascia is, is a big organ, uh, but that's incorrect. It's not a, a standalone organ. And as we talked about a moment ago, when you cut the fascia with a scalpel blade, the, the fascia is the sinew, you know, like in the turkey at Thanksgiving, the white tissue, that little, that's fascia. And it's, a, it's a, a semiconductor and electrons move the speed of light when it's intact, but when it's injured or cut, it stops everything. And so that's why I, often after surgery, the scars are the pain generators more so than what the surgeon was working on. And not that he's a bad surgeon. It's just that you incise the fashion. That electricity is not going to work the way you thought. Um, the interstitium has now been uh, elevated as to the 80th organ. There were 78 organs three years ago. And finally, we got smart. And this group was part of this. The omentum, the fat around the, the GI tract, is now the 79th organ because that's how the gut and the microbiome and the food that we eat talk to the rest of the body. It's got to go through this mesentery. So the mesentery is now the 79th organ. The interstitial space, we just talked about it, the tissue between the skin and the muscle and the interstitium goes all over the body. That's the 80th organ. And I think soon we'll have to designate the 81st organ as being the uh, lining, the endocalyx, of the capillary bed. I mean, 60,000 miles of this, I think that constitutes an organ. So that'll be 81. And then 82, um, <clears throat> the microbiome, even though it's not really us, it, it's an organ. And we need to, and we're going to start doing fecal tran fecal matter transplants. You know, people that are overweight, it's not what we thought. Uh, they've taken a little skinny rat and a fat rat and swapped their microbiome, their gut content. And the bacteria makes the skinny one fat and the fat one skinny. This is bacterial, guys. It's not, I can't push away from the donuts. It's a metabolic issue. So 82 organs. And when women get pregnant and they have a placenta, that'll be the 83rd organ. It's intermittent. And again, scars uh, surround uh, all of our muscles. It's stocking a fascia. It's a wiring system. And when you have a scar, that's trouble. And tattoos also uh, are trouble. They create trouble as well. And they act like a frayed wire and they block electrical transmission. And the fascial components, when people have mild fascial pain, uh, a lot of athletes wear these athletic compression gears because when you surround a muscle with really tight fascia, it makes it stronger. That's why defects in the fascia and tears, the weakness of fascia, make us weaker. And the skeleton thinks he's smarter than the fascia. I don't know. I'll let you argue about that one. And here's the fascia in our back and how important that is. And then we do the lumbar surgery. You can see what we're doing. That's a huge piece of fascia. And it's an electrical conductor. Um, uh, if you look at the soft sound, people that have this patient has no back pain. Here's the skin on the surface, a little subcutaneous fat a little epimesium over the muscle, and there's a thoracodorsal muscle. Here's a person with back pain. See how different and bright the ultrasound image is, and I wish this would play, because what happens, people with back pain, the fascia doesn't slide. We need hyaluronic acid in there to allow these layers to slide. A lot of folks that have low back pain, we need to inject hyaluronic acid or some of these regenerative solutions, so all these layers will slide and not be stuck together. And fascia sites, these little cells that live there, are the ones that secrete the hyaluronic acid. And these were just recently discovered. I mean, it's so cool. We're still discovering new cells we've never heard of. We're still discovering new. There's a ganglion right here at the side of C2 that we just discovered. Um, so anyway, again, take what I say tonight, that this is as much as I know tonight, and I don't have any financial reason to say it other 
And but I am human, and it's all I know. And, and and take what you need about it, but don't think that it can't change. And here's another issue: is that we were taught in, in medical school that tissues have layers, like a surface layer, and then an intermediate, and then a deeper. That's not how tissues organized at all. It is like this. It's not parallel. It's in series. And here's an extensor, like at an elbow. So we're learning, and this is called biological tensile integrity. And like a machine with tensile integrity, it's got to have all the component parts and struts and compression components. So does tissue. And that's why we have to repair the stuff, and you can't do it with a suture. That's why we need our stem cells. We need it to grow back the way God intended, the way it was meant to grow. And it's it's really easy to inject. If you can put it in the right spot and the patient's healthy, they will grow that tissue back correctly in a way that a surgeon could never put that back together. Now let's talk about degenerative arthritis. <clears throat> this is a paper that Ola Grimsby is a manual therapist. They were the first doctors on earth. We've talked about this. Um, they wrote this down in the mid 1600s. They were the first physicians to write down their notes. And then came the chiropractors, 1700s or so, and then 1800, the osteopaths. And then the homeopaths came in the 1900s. AMDs like me didn't come around until 1904. So the very first physicians on the planet were manual therapists. And their mantra is soft tissue is the issue. And they aren't big about moving bones like chiropractors. They want to take care of the soft tissue. And Ola Grimsby and I worked on this paper in the side view of a knee. And it's just showing the axis of motion. It's called a centroid. And if you drove a, a screw through that, that would be the center of action. So each time the knee moved, the femur and tibia relationship would be around that centroid. And you can see it's about five centimeters above the joint line and along the posterior cortex right there. Once you tear your cruciate ligament, the relationship of those two bones changes. And try as they might, surgeons have a hard time. Look at the, look at the difference in the, the centroid here. After ACL surgery, the ACL is too tight and the, the axis of rotation is moved down and forward. This one's way down. Now, the cruciate ligament uh, is repaired. It looks great on the MR, but it's not made the way it was intended. And it wears out that knee joint. And that's why the total knees, and if you had to have one, I understand that. But before you do that, try to give your mother nature a chance and try to rehab that. Now, what we know about uh, uh, arthritis, when you have bone on bone, so-called, your hyaline cartilage is thin. And the meniscus is fiber cartilage. It's a spacer between the femur and the tibia. But the femur and tibia are lined by very slick hyaline cartilage that allows it to slide and be slippery. A lubricin is made by the cartilage. It's the slickest substance known to man. It's slicker than Teflon. It's really cool. And it's made by the, by the uh, mammals. Um, what you want uh, is ideal cartilage. You can't, it's Goldilocks. It's like I could put your knee in a, in a brace and it couldn't move, it wouldn't hurt, but it'll wither. So underloading makes the cartilage wither. And if you've got a torn cruciate ligament, your knee's wobbly and moves too much, overloading will erode the cartilage. What you need is perfectly restored ligament structures because joint pain, joint issues are ligament, ligament, ligament. Do not worry about this cartilage and all these things. The ligaments are the static stabilizers of every joint. When your ligaments are torn, the joints are too far and they'll wear out. The muscles on the outside are dynamic stabilizers. They're there to build and move muscle. They're not to, there to hold the bone. The ligament holds the bone together, the muscle moves it. So when the cruciate ligament's torn, the tibia moves too much, the hamstring muscle muscle tries to act like a ligament. It can't do it. The most commonly torn muscle in the body is the hamstring because the ACL ligament's torn. The muscle tries to hold the tibia and then it gets torn. 
So when kids come in with a hamstring tear, I treat the ACL and the hamstring tear. The problems, the ligament, ligament, ligament. Uh, now we'll talk about the science of 5% uh, glucose. Uh, there are thousands of bags of D5W, 5% glucose in every hospital. They're acidified, so you have to put a few drops of sodium bicarb to make them a neutral pH 7.4. And once you do that, you can inject them into trigger points, chronic trigger points around the body, and it will turn pain off instantly. It is the coolest thing ever. And John Liftoff is the physician that brought this back to life. They knew this century ago, and people just forgot about it. And John Liftoff redeveloped it, and he lost his medical license in New Zealand for injecting sugar water because it flew in the face of pharmaceutical and surgical uh, pathways. How long is that pain staying away, Dr. Arfield, too? Someone asked that in the chat. I thought that was a good. Uh, it, it depends. If you've, if you've had it a long time, it may take five or six sessions. In other words, some people come, ah, oh, this thing's hard for 20 years. Okay, well, I'll tell you this. It's going to take five or six sessions. I like doing them a week apart, but sometimes if we travel out of country and we're giving uh, lectures and teaching folks, we're only there seven days. Like in Mexico, uh, we treat a thousand, twelve hundred little Mexicans every time we go down and do teaching courses. I'll inject them every day and it'll stay away for a long time. And once you get the patient back to zero where they're out of that chronic pain cycle, then they'll do something once or twice a year you know, break the yard, twist. If you'll come right in and inject that with glucose within a day or so, one treatment. So Andrew, thank you. That Yeah, that's a great question. It's amazing. And here's the injection. This is a, a diagram taken that's over 200 years old from a chiropractor's office in Florida. But it had, see all the little nerves below the skin here. So we're not injecting the big brachial nerves or the axillary nerve we're injecting these little tributaries. And it's kind of like a submarine laying on the bottom of the lake. They send these little feelers to the surface of the, of the water, monitoring that. And so by putting a few drops of sugar right there in those little peripheral nerves, it travels instantly electrically and turns off the pain message in that big nerve. And again, it's just below the surface of the skin. Now, here's what's cool. I'm a radiologist, so I like taking pictures of stuff. <laughs> And if you wonder what this looks like on an MR, the white stuff, it looks like depth charges. These are, you know, half a CC injections of D5 because this patient had a shoulder problem. And so they came in for a shoulder arthrogram. And they always order that with gadolinium, which is a very dangerous metal if it breaks down your body. And it costs $1,400. And most folks, when they come in with a shoulder problem, have God's contrast. There's a joint effusion. The patient already had fluid in their joint. So with MR, I just did a water-weighted sequence. I didn't need any IV contrast in the joint. Uh, excuse me, uh, intra-articular contrast. So I saved the risk of inexpensive gadolinium. And by the way, because they were, they were having pain, I injected some glucose in the joint and this D5 buffered along the painful trigger points. Can you see these little depth charges? The patient gets off the table after the diagnostic arthrogram. His shoulder doesn't hurt, and he never went back to the surgeon. Now, I say that, and, and I can do that because I'm older, but if you're younger, well, you all just, I mean, you're going to get flack if they send you a patient to try to set them up for surgery, and you screw it up and, and, and get rid of their pain problem because there's a muscular, you know, 30 muscles in the shoulder, 30 muscles. Now, four rotator cuffs, they do surgery on them, 30 muscles. They're, it's out of whack. It's antalgic. So I want to fix the pain problem and let the shoulder go back home. And I don't want to put steroids in there. And I don't want to make it numb. I can put lidocaine in your shoulder and it won't hurt, but it, you don't have a shoulder. You don't have any motor, sensory, or pain fiber. Glucose only turns off the pain. And you can still have sensory and motor, so your a shoulder still works. 5% glucose, folks, D5W. It's, it's kind of amazing. This is the electricity. I'll, I'll, I'll just won't worry about that. Oh, this is the uh, tailgate party, the so-called tailgate party uh, injection. These kids will 
find us at the Razorback games and I go, are you Dr. Hartsfield? And I go, oh, maybe. And I go, Dr. Johnson told me if I found you, you could eject my shoulder. And I go, okay, uh, come over here. And uh, we put a little glucose in this part of the shoulder. That's called the quadrilateral space right back here. And it's the fuse box for the shoulder, the axillary nerve, the radial nerve and older nerves all live here. And you can see the, the fluid now. I've injected sugar water in that quadrilateral space, immediately resets the shoulder and, and they're almost pain-free. It's amazing. And one of the other things, when you stick a needle in the skin, now here's a here's a capillary bed, guys. So you can, the, not only do the nerves go right to the edge of the skin surface, but also the arteries and, and vasculature does as well. And under ultrasound, remember I injected that shoulder right here. The, these arteries dilate immediately when I do the injection also. On ultrasound, here's the skin, subcutaneous fat, and muscle. Within two minutes of a needle, this glucose injection, look how dilated the vessels are. So A, you turn the pain off, and B, you turn the fire hydrant on. You increase blood flow to this area of the patient. Now, here's the kicker, a lot, of, a lot more blood flow, great, but what if your blood's not well? What if we didn't go through the Health Revival Partners evaluation and make sure your thyroid was okay? You're basically, you got uh, blood that's not very healthy. So that's why, again, it's important to do these injections, but that they are uh, in addition to, not instead of, a good health plan. And this just talks about using glucose to treat carpal tunnel syndrome. Here's the uh, sugar water here around the median nerve. You don't need surgery to free the median nerve up. It's stuck. It's It's got a scar or something in the carpal tunnel right here. You can go in under ultrasound and inject the glucose around it. And you see how the sugar water's uh, longwise. Here's the median nerve with the dark sugar water in the front and back. 15 minutes, 30 minutes, completely absorbed. And the median nerve works normally. And again, literature's replete with all this and the fact that it works and that it's safe. So it's not like we're making this up. Uh, and then one last thing, the stellate ganglion, we are using to treat folks. And again, we don't call this PTSD. The service members ask us not to give them a disorder. I, I'm okay with it. So the PTS shot treats the stellate ganglion. Here's the somatic nerves, the brain, the spinal cord, and the, the somatic nerves that move your arms and so forth. These are the autonomic nerves. And we're really interested in the sympathetic fight or flight. And right next door is the vagus nerve too. And if we'll inject, and look how big the vagus nerve, huge, the vagabond. But if you look right here in the front of this person, the stellate sympathetic ganglion is right here at C7, C6. And under ultrasound, we put the needle right here and inject. We started doing with bupivacaine, kind of a long acting uh, anesthetic. And the patient gets a really dense paralysis for about four hours and it works great. But there's a lot of things you can do by injecting anteriorly. You have to be an interventional radiologist like me or somebody that knows how to do it. What we learned how to do now, uh, again, there's a little ganglion right there. Under ultrasound, we had a 60 minutes episode a couple of years ago. Sean Mulvaney is our colleague uh, in, in service that, that, that did the 60 minutes part. We figured out you don't have to go in the front here. You can go from the back posteriorly right through the muscle. There's nothing that you can harm. And we're not using bupivacaine. We're using buffered glucose. And it's resetting that fight or flight. So a lot of our folks that come in that have had chronic pain, they have stress. You don't have to be at a rock, at a, at a rock and, and have that sort of stress. That's one type of issue. And a lot of younger kids and football players, we do these little PTS shots on all, all those folks with our glucose. And it helps reset their stress levels. Um, you know what, I'm kind of at, at a, a point here where I probably should take questions and you guys can have the uh, PowerPoint and, and we talked a little about flavor rich plasma and mesochymal cells and amnion and so forth. Um, why, don't we, why don't we do that? Scott? All righty. Well, we have questions here. Let's start at the top. That was, uh, that was sorry. brilliant. <laughs> wow. 
Yeah, good. And stuff. by by the way, Dr. Hartsfield, um, you mentioned procaine before. Where where does procaine come into all that? And and almost tangentially too, like what if you do that with a, a healthy person? So we're talking about okay, someone who has maybe some high stress or or even the PTSD, if we call it that. Um, what about a healthy person? Or sure. someone that's right. Thinks they're healthy. <laughs> Thinks they're healthy, which is actually, yeah, that's a better way to put it. Sure. Um, I've I, I, all the stuff that I do to in my regenerative practice, I've done to myself or had done to me. And I never really thought about being stressed or anything like that. And I've had some of these PTS shots. And I'm telling you, I feel better. I, I, I did not feel good. But I, and I make, joke about this i'm funnier <laughs> say okay after i get one of these i'm going to be funnier for about a week but um we've been using a little bit of procaine to get the uh kind of computer effect when the computer's messed up you need to reboot it so you need to, to take this you don't need a dense uh paralysis but the, a little bit of procaine and eight most of it 80 percent of it's the glucose so the the restorative the nourishment part of the sugar water and you get a little bit of procaine. So you reset the nerve, turn it off and let it come back on. And you're getting both sympathetic, fight or flight, as well as parasympathetic. And because they live right next door. And what we noticed about procaine, it's a more natural form of anesthetic. It originally came from cocaine. Remember, it's a, nat a natural path <clears throat> from the 1900s. Uh, Joseph Bayer was using the powder. They were using it for numbing and whatnot, and they were playing with it with their bare hands. And he went to give a lecture in Europe about it, and halfway over, he started getting withdrawals. He went, my gosh, this cocaine is addictive. And so he calls some telegrams back, whatever, and says, hey, put this in a liquid form. So they, that was the very first anesthetic was procaine. And it's a more natural form of an anesthetic. Lidocaine's a synthetic and it's an ester. It acts a little differently. Procaine is an amide. It's more, contains a nitrogen group, like an amino acid, that sort of thing. You gotta be sure folks are not allergic to sulfur and those sort of things, but it is a, it acts faster, goes away faster. So it acts really quick, goes away 45 minutes. Lidocaine, a couple hours. Um, and it really has had a uh, wonderful effect for a lot of our folks. Um, uh, some of them, it's amazing. And a, a man and I are talking to these folks, and they'll break down in tears and just start crying and hug you. I mean, I, you just go, wow, 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 wow. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you for that question. Man. Amazing. We have a question that says, uh, how can you locate someone who does the sugar injections like you do? And does insurance cover the procedure? Um, it, it's sort of like a trigger point, but it's not specifically covered. Uh, we have folks, the American Academy of Orthopedic Medicine, AALM. Okay, that's not American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery. And when you think about orthopedic medicine, you go, what? <laughs> orthopedic medicine? That's what this is. And uh, we've got diplomates all over the country that know how to do this. And I can help you, you know. Find it. You can talk to us. Okay. Uh, someone is asking, have you ever treated thoracic outlet syndrome? <laughs> every day. Every day. And we were talking a second ago about carpal tunnel release, remember, where we take the, the sugar water and hydrodissect like a fire hose. You, you blow that sugar water around that median nerve. And it's scarred in because there's a lot of flexor tendons and whatnot. In fact, let me go back to that little picture right quick and kind of give you a sense. Yeah, right there. Okay. So here's a short axis look, the little median nerves here uh, coming straight at us. This dark stuff is the glucose, the dextrose around it. And in 15 and 30 minutes, it's absorbed. Now, what we do for the thoracic outlet, you go up here with the base of the neck. Because between the anterior and middle scalene muscles, these big muscles here, and by the way, this happens in people that do a lot of upper extremity stuff, like guitar players and violinists, you can imagine. These muscles get really big up here. And when the nerves come out, C4 through T1 come out and form three little trunks right there, and it compresses them. And that's thoracic outlet 
it's a thoracic inlet is when stuff can't get in, uh, like venous return. When you have a swollen extremity, the same problem is called thoracic inlet. But when it's a problem getting innervation out, it's thoracic outlet. It's the same issue. It's right at the, the thoracic uh, inlet right here. And under Ulcin, you just hydrodissect with, we use a little bit of procaine and some dextrose. And whenever I'm doing a shoulder procedure on someone to make it so it doesn't, it's not as painful, is I'll do some procaine and dextrose right here at the brachial plexus and it gives a complete block of their upper extremity. It's not, it, they can still use it, but it's numb enough so that when we do our little injection into their torn rotator cuffs or whatever we're treating the shoulder, by doing that brachial plexus injection, it frees up that brachial plexus outlet. And a lot of these folks think they have rotator cuff. They have, to this person's question, they have thoracic outlet. They have compression of those brachial nerves right there. And we can open that up and free that up. And it's under all sun. It's kind of fun. The patient likes to watch that. You can see the fluid free the nerves up and they slide back and forth in the muscle compartment. All right. By the way, uh, we have another question here, but if anyone wants that PowerPoint, uh, Dr. Harshfield has provided it to me. If you want it, I'll send it to you. I put the email, my email in the chat. It's info at lairdwellness.com, info at lairdwellness.com. Just uh, email me and say, hey, give me the PowerPoint and I'll send it off to you. All right. So can you treat herniated discs with this injection? What we do is herniated discs. Yes and no, but let me just say the yes part first. Most herniated discs are not the pain generators. If you really have discogenic pain, and, and we have a group that we're doing a protocol, we do disc injection, but it's a whole other issue and you can treat it that way. Now, most people have herniated disc. The disc is just the spacer. That's not the problem. The problem is the vertebra in the back, the facet where the vertebra move back and forth, it's a facet problem or a muscle problem along the spine. And if you'll, these people come in with these MRs, oh my gosh, I've got two herniations and whatever. We do this glucose injection, shallow injection, 80% of these folks pain go away. So I would say, try this first, even if you've got a disc herniation, it may not be the pain generator, and the muscle and tissue that have, that are in pain along the, the surface of the back are creating trouble. You walk funny. You antalgic gait can create trouble with the disc. Once you're out of pain and you can move freely, the way collagen is laid down is along lines of normal stress. So we, but if you're in pain, you're not going to move normally. So these. Mm -hmm dextrose injections relieve the pain and suddenly I can go play golf. I can walk and turn my hips. And, and now you start to rebuild your own tissues, remember, because these things are indirect effects. They don't fix you directly, but they allow you to fix you. So we, I would, if you, even if you've got a herniated disc or two, try this first. And if that's, that can relieve the pain over half the time, guaranteed. If it really is a disc issue, We've got other things we can do before surgery, um, but I would try this first. One last question. Is there a practitioner in Illinois that you can recommend? Uh, yes, there is. Um, I'll tell you what, email us and let me connect you with her. Um, Annette is in Chicago. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Dave, do you mind also... I'm just wondering where you, how far this goes. So we obviously know with like listening to Dr. Carter, how important, you know, how full is your bucket, right? But let's say someone has really bad kidneys. Where are you, where do you kind of go, okay, well, they're so far gone now that we really have to rely on some sort of stem cell therapy, or what do you do with kidneys that are really losing their function? Well, that's a or great any question. Other organ? Yeah. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> Usually when you have an organ like a kidney or a brain that has that high of blood flow, you get a problem. And it's almost always not primarily from that organ. It's something secondary to that. And you got to chase that part down. Uh, 
Um, that's what Mike, Michael Carter does all the time. Your kidney is trying its best to filter your blood. Your blood's dirty. And sometimes you can have a, a kidney problem like a, a stone. It's infection. Uh, so it's unusual. You can have congenital problems with kidneys, like cystic kidney disease and those sorts of things. But a healthy, to have had healthy kidneys and then have them deteriorate, remember diabetes, those sorts of things are hard on those organs. We're doing uh, some intravenous stem cell under protocol now. You can't do this unless it's under an IRB institutional review board approved protocol. We did that for COVID patients because FDA was real lenient. And we had some folks that had long COVID that included renal issues and mentation. They inhaled these stem cells and we gave them IP. Cardiopulmonary function, blood pressure, everything improved, including mentation. So we know that there are ways to provide regenerative biologics to these folks with chronic organ issues, but we can't just focus on that. Andrew, I'm, I'm, I hate to not answer your question, but again, we don't want to get organ focused. We want to look at the entire rubber test tube. And like Dr. Carter knows, there are a lot of things that make those kidneys sick. It is secondary issues, not necessarily primary. Dr. Harshfield, we have a lot of questions about uh, different states, so I won't list them off, but is there somewhere people can email you to uh, get a list of folks or maybe just individual states where you know someone who will do this? Uh, what email should they uh, contact you at? Um, let me give them a... We, I think we'll... We have a uh, Integrative Cellular Medicine Society, the ICMS, is the group that kind of does this around the, around the world, actually. And that's a great LinkedIn site to go to and read our articles and, and add these questions. This is a perfect group to do that. If you'll email Amana, um, we'll find you guys some of our AAOM. And also, there's a link to the AAOM for those folks, too. And it's AK. F A H O U M at gmail.com. Okay. A F A K F A H O U M at mm -hmm. gmail.com. Yep. All right. I'm going to put that in the chat. Fantastic. Great. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to leave that up there just for a couple of minutes until you can all. Thank you, uh, Andrew, for doubling up on that. Did I get that wrong or did you just double up? Just no, double no, up? I just doubled up. I do see <laughs> J Jack's had his hand up for a while. I think he's he's been trying to ask a question. Oh, first. I'm sorry. Thank you for noticing that. Yes, Jack, go ahead. Hi. Uh, wonderful presentation, doctor. Uh, I've been following Harry Massey and NES Health for, for years now. And I was wondering if uh, he would be, his uh, organization would be among those that you consider leaders in the bio energetics area is in pharmaceuticals and technologies um, or uh, are there others that you would find competitive with them in terms of quality? Um, th th that is an important area and there are a lot of folks that are doing some good work, Jack, to your point. There's a, a, a nutraceutical component, obviously. What we're doing here with biologics and regenerative is different. Uh, photo biodynamics, all that is so wide open right now. And there are a lot of fo folks doing great things, different things, but great things. And again, I would just kind of look and see how patients do, you know, see how what their outcomes are. It's very safe, obviously. Yeah. And then um, I've known of uh, Dr. Reardon's uh, stem cell clinic in Panama for years. Is there any reason if we uh, we're interested in doing placental uh, stem cells and we could afford it uh, not to go there since they're not available here in the United States. Um, they are, we are really close to getting these uh, available in the U S and Neil Reardon is a PhD out of Texas. I've known him for a long time. He's a great guy. He's done a lot of great research. One of the pioneers of all this. And, but as you say, you got to go to Panama city not Florida, the real one, uh, to get these therapies. And they're pretty impressive. And to your point, they use uh, cord blood and amnion issues. And um, 
we're going to start having clinics in the United States. They're going to be able to use those things. Again, it has to be under an IRB. Um, and some of these companies are now coming out. I think what the FDA is going to do with this, Jack, is they're going to treat these uh, cell therapies like drugs and make you go through hoops. You got to pay $15, $20 million for an investigation, new drug license, but it'll be able to be done in the U.S. So the... It'll just, unfortunately, it'll take years for that to uh, filter down to uh, affordability, I would think. Well, maybe not because the initial, the protocols we're doing right now, we do, we do not charge patients to do these uh, efficacy trials. The first thing you do is you do a safety trial to show that they work. And then you do an efficacy trial to show how well they work. And then you can go to phase three and so forth. But no one with any reputation in science is charging patients. They were doing that for a while, pretending like they were study protocols they were charging for. So if you can get in one of these protocols, the biologic is paid for. That's wonderful to hear. Yep. All right. Thank you, Jack. All right. Well, Dr. Harshfield, you've had the entire word. So I wonder if Dr. Carter would like the last word. <laughs> Yay. Land the plane, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great, great presentation. Uh, well, question, Jack, what, what is it that you're trying to address um, when you were asking about the, um, the stem cells? So, yeah, because I know Neil and Panama, I've been down to that center at least three or four times there. It's a fabulous, um, uh, you know, institution down there and they've done some amazing things. And yes, you know, they are, they are able to expand, you know, stem cells, whether they're umbilical cord or, you know, um, you know from your own uh, stem cell lines, whether it be blood or bone marrow, or what have you. So, um, so they, you know, they are one of the leaders, of course, there are other institutions around the world, but what is it that you're trying to address? Oh, I'm, I'm just still in years of intensive information gathering to try to provide resources to family members and friends uh, for uh, alternatives that gotcha. would be available uh, to help them. Unfortunately, none of my family members and friends ever listened to me. <laughs> so it's, uh, yes, and so it's so frustrating to know that uh, a friend with uh, severe spinal stenosis or even as simple as a, a rotator cuff injury or severe osteoarthritis could be, you know, could be helped. And uh, they're still doing just just normal physical therapy, which might be helpful, but it's light years behind uh, what could be available to them. And yeah. some of my friends can, can afford, they can afford the time as well as the cost. Right. So, yeah. And, you know, uh, but there are a whole lot of other beneficial things in between that, such as the shockwave therapy. You'd be amazed at how well that does on any orthopedic injury, you know, even, you know, things as uh, partial ACL tears, um, because mm -hmm. we have a lot of um, athletes using our device. And of course we have, you know, five, at least 500 centers using our particular device. And of course there, there are other, you know, competitors out there. So there are thousands of locations that are using shockwave devices. Ours just well, I wish I, I, I wish I could have uh, channeled you to my urologist years ago when I was asking him uh, uh, to receive information about the acoustic wave therapy right. for ED and Peronis. Yeah, and, he, and he said to me, enough of your information, Jack, already. What are you, my professor? <laughs> yeah. well, well, but that's what happens with traditional doctors. So, so but that's why right. you're on our form. Because yes, it, it definitely can be an effective strategy um, for a whole host of things, you know, and then there's the peptide therapy. So lots of uses um, in pretty much every realm on that. And, you know, they're just various uh, protocols, but still, you know, it still kind of goes back to kind of finding out the 
the underlying causes and the inflammatory uh-huh. markers. But you know, I've you know I've been on peptide therapy for a number of years and found it quite beneficial. And you know, I'm starting to introduce more and more patients to it, whether it's an oral form or injectable form for uh, various things. But that can be very very beneficial and you know quite a bit substantially lower in cost uh, than stem cells yeah. however still not cheap though so yeah still so very looking very forward to looking forward to dr holtoff uh, yeah yep. when i saw Absolutely. when i when i saw his um uh, peptide therapy conference last year and Absolutely. purchased it yeah, I, I I've been in a traumatic brain injury group for ten years now, huh, okay. and I provided my provided uh, detailed information to my neuropsychologist about uh, you know the doctors uh, whose son almost died from the uh, repeated blow uh, blows to the head with the huh. crowbar. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The woman, the doctor, who's uh, medical director of TB twelve clinic in New England. Mm. And my, you know, my my neuropsychologist just wasn't interested. Yeah. yeah. And three of my three of my group members again, very frustrating. Thank you, Jack. Uh, we want to give Jesse a chance to ask her a question, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, Dr. Jesse, go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harshfield, for such an intelligent, informative lecture. My question is regarding fibromyalgia. And I actually asked how how many cc's of fluid, uh, the 5% dextrose you're using per injection. And I'm thinking it would depend on what you're injecting. But, you know, in fibromyalgia, usually there is widespread knots or, you know, trigger points all over the body. And I was wondering if you've used the therapy, uh, I think you alluded to it, in fibromyalgia. And then my other question was uh, concerning guafenicin and Dr. Paul St. Amand's uh, protocol, I don't know if you've heard of it, where he was able to relieve the trigger points by titrating guafenicin and using it over a period of time. And I actually have some patients who treated with his protocol. Not everybody responds to it, but uh, it does work in some patients. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question, Jess. Um, the fibromyalgia issue, <clears throat> I mean, how in the heck can your entire skin and interstitial space hurt? You know, it's, it's such a generalized issue. It's going to be more of a systemic problem. Now, a lot of these folks have got areas that are more tender than others, and we use this glucose injection like you'd use a trigger point injection, uh, but not with the steroids. Now, as you know, there these other there are a lot of mesotherapies. They're called mesotherapy, where they inject the interstitial space. They've done that for years. Tramiel, T R A M E E L, is a company. Familiar that. with that? Yeah. Uh huh. It made a bunch of really good nutraceuticals to inject. So any way that we can put uh, so, uh, neural adjustment into this interstitial space, it, it helps these folks. Now, to your point, usually when you're injecting these, you're using a Botox 30-gauge needle, half inch. So it kind of limits you to about two-tenths of a cc. It didn't take much. Mm. And you just kind of go along and... And what we usually will do is we'll have the patient show us what hurts. Those are active trigger points. Okay. Go along and you kind of know the nerve distribution, like for a shoulder, the dorsal scapular nerve, down the back, obviously, scapula's not seating properly. You go along that and you go, does that hurt, hurt? Yes, 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 yes. And you'll inject those. Then you'll inject some spots that the patient doesn't know, the latent trigger points. There's a way to treat an entire quadrant with it. It's a few injections now, but it's not volume wise that much. Uh, and it really relieves a lot of that pain. But again, it's not the, the treatment for myofascial. I mean, it can help them when they really have a lit up like hip SI joint. Boy, that's really debilitating. You help them, but it's not going to really fix the entire myofascial issue. It's going to be more, you know, Michael can tell you more about how to fix that interstitial space. Thank you. 
All right, thank you, Dr. Harshfield. Wonderful presentation. Lots of uh, thanks up and down the uh, the chat there.